you know, a serpentine belt wear used to be really easy. You could take a look at it and you'd see the cracks and the splits, missing sections of rib, but not so much anymore. So if you're trying to solve a squealing issue or a noise complaint from a customer or just want to make sure that uh, your customer is not going to experience a problem down the road, you need to know some other ways of inspecting the belts and handling these issues. And for that, we're turning to some of the experts at Daco. Let me introduce Robert Christie. He is the Director of Marketing for Daco. Robert, how are you doing today? Wonderful. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate you having us. No, we certainly appreciate you taking the time to share you know, Daco's expertise with us. So I know you've got a lot of great information for us. Uh, why don't you go ahead and take it over, and I will interject as... Uh, as something comes up. <laughs> All righty. Um, you're right. Let's see if I get this right. Pete, you're exactly right. Um, certainly pa over the past 10 years, there's been a lot of changes that happened in serpentine belts and the drive design and everything else. In the past, uh, you used to open up the hood. If you saw some cracks, you knew the, the belt needed to be replaced. In fact, in, out there in the field, I've been with Daco for quite a while, and out there in the field, we used to go in and see technicians, professional technicians, and we'd open up hoods and we'd challenge them saying, okay, I can I can find 20% of the cars in your parking lot that has a belt that needs replaced, and we were right almost every time. It was real easy to see. Pop the hood, look for cracks. As you see here on the screen, it's called, I call it the evolution of drive uh, designs and the evolution of belts as well. On the left, it's kind of a simple drive, a four-point drive that the way the belts used to be. Sometimes there was two belts on a vehicle, two serpentine belts, but they were simple drives. Uh, those belts were made of neoprene. Uh, the failure mode was cracking, easy to detect. Uh, noise was hardly ever an issue back then, unless extreme cases. And at that point, uh, one construction for a replacement belt worked for pretty much every application. Well, what has happened today is, as you see to the right, is a very complicated drive. Today's vehicles are made with usually one belt that runs up to 10 or more components on a, on a vehicle. Um, either It'd be either either pulleys or any air conditioning components, alternator components, and everything else. So as you can see, the belt is asked to do a lot more. Um, one other thing, the belt construction has changed. The rubber compound has changed uh, right around the year 2000. Um, you know, the belts that we designed for original equipment manufacturers, uh, that changed as well. And it went to an EPDM compound, which is um, a very long name, but we, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a very long name. I'm very la <laughs> it's it's interesting because we, we, we just did a, a seminar, webinar on, on the cooling system service and talked yeah. a little bit about belts and, and uh, awarded a prize for the person who could first tell us what EPDM stood for. So, uh, you, you, yeah. you know what? I might do that here in the office to see how many people work for Daco can pronounce it right. So it would <laughs> be interesting. So, yeah. So, you know, the, the, so the difference between EPDM and neoprene, simply put, is, you know, we were, you know, we're always trying to improve uh, compounds and, um, and get belts to last longer. And EPDM is is a it's a stiffer rubber compound. It absolutely lasts longer. And Pete, if you can remember, I know I can. Um, you know, when I was working with my grandfather in the garage, belts would be replaced at max fifty thousand miles. And and nowadays, um, belts are lasting a lot longer, upwards of nearly one hundred thousand miles before people replace more, even more. And yeah. And, and it's like, well, what has happened? Well, the EPDM lasts a lot longer, and, and they do a great job. Uh, that stiff rubber compound um, also brings some other characteristics. I mean, the belt wears completely different. That real um, robust compound doesn't crack like the, the softer neoprene did before. Um, so it loses rubber material. It loses rubber material um, similar to a tire. Also, uh, Noise now is a big issue. So why is noise a big issue? And and I think we'll get in more detail later. But if you look at that really complicated drive right there, sure. And and it has say a hundred thousand miles on it. You're putting a replacement belt on it. Well, that car has a hundred thousand miles, and it's maybe eight years old or six years old. It's it's far from perfect. Things wear pulleys wear, bearings wear, and all that. So sometimes there's some very slight misalignments that the new belt has to contend with. So you put a brand new, very stiff EPDM belt on a car that's kind of worn in, if, if you will, and any misalignment usually presented itself as a noise. It comes out and it, it does not react well with EPDM sometimes at the early years. So what we discovered is, you know, we changed, we had to adjust 
compounds, our rib style, we have a W rib that, it, that conforms somewhat to misalignments. So, so that is one, what we have to contend with today, where noise was really never a big, big issue. Today, it's the biggest issue. So diagnosing noise and understanding how, it, how, to, um, how to fix it is, is, a, is one of our biggest concerns today. Mm. So moving on. Again, when I talk about belts in the past versus belts today, you look at both of these images, and the one up top is sure. easy to identify, Pete, sure. as you said. You open up a hood, you see some chunks and cracks, and say, I right, replaced the belt, it's easy. Um, no big deal. But the one on the bottom looks, looks fairly decent. Um, but the thing of it is, the ribs have lost so much material, that belt is severely worn. But, uh, you know, a quick look, without further inspection, it would have been overlooked, and, and that belt could, uh, you know, could fail at any day. So well, I think that's a good point too that you're making, Robert. The, the, I like the tire analogy. I mean, we may not be losing it from the from the and to clarify the surface of the ribs, but actually the spacing in between, right? That's the size more so than oh, the yeah. top, right? So, so yeah, it's a very good analogy. And, and as you pointed out, uh, it's visually it it may appear fine, um, but in terms of its operation, it may be near failure. Right. You know, Pete, there's another way to look at it. I've explained it to other technicians that, you know, you start off, the, the rib profile is like a V. And when you start off at a V, and, it's, and as the belt wears, that V turns into a U, meaning the ribs are getting thinner. So that, mm -hmm. that U, as it's riding in pulleys, is sloppy. It moves around a little bit. There's some slipping. Uh, even cause some malfunction of components like the alternator. There's been even check engine lights been been uh, been set off by slipping belts and the, and the alternator's fine. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Good point. Again, this is one of the things where you know we have to be careful when we're doing our diagnostics that even little things that you may not think of being related uh, can be a cause. That's, uh, that's sure. a great point. I'm going to move on here. Um, this explained the V and U example I just gave you. You know, kind of graphically you know, shows it without too much exaggeration on a simple drawing that your V turned into a U and you lost material and it just it won't react well it'll it'll uh, it'll, it'll cause uh, like I said lots of belt slipping usually is when you start to hear noise or or um, alternator issues or air conditioning issues mostly noise mm -hmm. here we we love this this is like the lineup you see on uh, on court TV you know all the <laughs> the various examples of belt wear it's a uh, the first one is is today's rib wear, where it looks fairly decent, but the, the ribs are severely worn. The second one actually is a, a horrible case of uh, belt neglect, and uh, and there's pieces missing. That that car, we actually saw that where we got that example of belt, and it was truly amazing that that car was still running. That thing was hanging on by a couple ribs. <laughs> Amazing, and as you can see, it going across all the different various degrees of wear that you know professional technicians open up the hood. They need to look at the back of the belt, the front of the belt, the sides, and um, and uh, and make sure that the belt's inspected. If it's anywhere near a hundred thousand miles, we say over eighty-five thousand miles, and it has the original belt on, then inspection is critical. Sure, absolutely, and I would kind of stress too that it, it, not even necessarily that mileage. If if you're doing a, your customer service. And with the ease that, uh, that you're going to show of how you can check these belts, um, because there are other factors. Ideally, sure, you know, 8,500,000 miles, but hey, things happen. You know, there may be a condition that's going to cause that belt to fail at, at half that. Um, and it's just part of doing a thorough, you know, inspection for your customers to make sure that you check the condition of, of, of not only the belts, but of course other components under the hood. But you know, the focus today is on belts. And uh, and it's very easy to check the condition of the serpentine belt you know, with the methods that you're going to share. Sure, and, and you're right, Pete. Every every example is different. They're unique. I mean, the weather conditions, the drive design itself from the origin from the manufacturer. Sometimes some drive designs are are designed to be severe on belts, and some are not. Some are real forgiving. So I mean, there's a lot of different variables that come into when belts will fail. It's not so easy to say, okay, at this miles done. The inspection is critical. Absolutely. Um, because of the changing, you know, used to we used to have a thing that we affectionately called a crackometer, and it was it was basically a one inch notch out of a, a little marketing tool that we used to set if there was four cracks within an inch, replace the belt. 
Well, as belt construction changed, rib wear, wear has certainly changed. Um, many of us belt manufacturers come out with unique tools. And in Daco, this is our, we call it an awareness gauge. And what this does is it, it can measure uh, wear, belt wear by rib depth, uh, rib profile, and even still can even do some cracks with the one-inch window. So as I move, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, you know, the crown on top, um, as you can see, that crown can go down in the belt. As you push that crown, the jagged edge, down in the belt profile, and if that gauge moves side to side, if it flops around there a little bit, that means those ribs are, are severely worn sure. and, and it needs to be replaced. Also, the little, the little uh, uh, leg at the bottom, that lays down in the rib. If you can't feel it anymore, um, it needs replaced. In that little square window there, that's a one inch square. So you can lay that over a belt ribs rib side and if you see cracks there like on some older style belts, you can still uh, quickly <laughs> identify. So you can identify rib in three different ways. So it's a it's a nice handy tool that we hand out everywhere we can and I think it's uh, I think many of the professional technicians appreciate you know when they're explaining um, that your belt is worn and you and some consumers look at a belt that appears to them to be somewhat okay and uh, it's kind of a hard sell sometimes if you don't have uh, these type tools like this to kind of uh, reinforce what you're saying. Say. Sure. Where can, the, you know, like say text or watching, <coughs> excuse me, um, where can they uh, pick one up? You know, any Deco distributor certainly um, uh, will have these available um, as, the, as they buy parts and certainly a Deco salespeople that we have out there throughout the whole country are armed with uh, buckets of these that they love to give out. But I mean, even go to the Deco website. If you go to the Deco website and uh, or Facebook uh, page and leave a message, we'd be happy to send anyone one or awesome. a handful. For oh, this awesome. class. You know, when it comes to noise, I mean, the whole thing is, you know, we said at the very beginning, Pete, noise is our biggest issue. Okay, and uh, when this all started, we kind of, I kind of coined the phrase that uh, belt noise is a symptom, not the cause. Now, you, we all know that. Uh, belts get blamed. If you put a new belt on and, and a week later they come back and it's making noise, the belt is to blame. But it really is it's the symptom of another issue. We call it like uh, belt noise is a check engine light and we playfully built this graphic. We, we wish it was this easy that something pops up in the car and says this is the cause of your noise. But just remember that if we put a brand new belt on um, on a vehicle and it comes back making noise, it's usually there's it's an indication we need to dive in a little further um, uh, that there's something else going on with the vehicle. So the first one is there's there's two types of noise to, the, the way we categorize them, chirp and squeal. Now it may sound silly but they're drastically different and they have two different causes. The number one cause for noise today is misalignment and usually chirps occur during misalignment and there's a couple handy, uh, we have a couple handy little tips. Uh, I don't have a picture of it in here but we're handing out little water bottles. Let me tell you about the water bottle test is while the vehicle's running and it's making noise, if, if uh, thank you, as the vehicle's running and making noise and you spray the rib side of the, uh, of the belt with water and, and the noise goes away, that's misalignment and that's a chirp. Now if the noise gets louder, that's a tension issue and that's called a squeal. I'll get into it a little bit further but it's a great little trick of the trade and, and another guy, another engineer told me who came up with this idea and there's also videos out there and Daco also has little handy water bottles but you, you, know, you get a water bottle from anywhere and squirt the rib side. But also if you rev the engine, a lot of times if, if it's making noise and you rev the engine and it goes away, usually that's a misalignment. If you rev the engine and the squeal gets even louder, that's a tension issue. So so hopefully um, you see the causes here at Chirp. Most of it is misalignment um, is the main cause for, you know, as professional technicians run into it. Well, I've got to ask you a question right here, Robert, because this actually came up during our demonstration of this on the, on the cooling system webinar. Uh, yeah, spraying the water, great trick, works very well. I used it to uh, find a misalignment issue on uh, my son's recently purchased 99 Ford Ranger. Okay. Uh, and uh, we blogged about that. You'll find that on the AutoPro Workshop if you want to check that out, guys. Um, but during the, the webinar, the question came up, not, what about water? What about soapy water or other chemicals? Uh, is it, should it be just water or will you get the same results with something else or should we not? You, can you address right, that right. question? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, most of the time you just need water. You don't need to add soap to it or anything else like that. Um, you got to be careful with adding anything to the water as far as contaminants. Um, soap I think is fine, um, but anything that has an oil base or silicone base could actually affect the EPDM belts. Even though EPDM is stronger, lasts a lot longer, but they don't react very well to various uh, types of chemicals such as lubricants. So we just got to be careful of that. That's the only thing I suggest. So yeah, just probably not a good idea to, to, to spray it with brake cleaner or fuel injection cleaner. Absolutely not. You'll see it later on in the, in the presentation. We list, um, you know, you get a lot of things can affect these belts in, in a negative way. Um, and I'll, I'll go through the list here in a, in, within a couple slides. But you're absolutely right. So I would stick with water. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, I would stick with water or to be on the safe side. And I got to ask you this too, because I noticed right here you've got it on your screen belt dressing. Right. Now, a lot of people go out and say, well, I want to cure that noisy belt. I'm going to go down to my local favorite parts house, and I'm going to buy me some belt dressing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's easy, and, you know, and, and I'm always amazed by that. Belt dressing has been around for a, a, a many, many years. Uh, bars of soap been around for many, many years. And, you know, <laughs> I remember, you know, many, many years ago, put, you know, I heard, I'd seen people put bars of soap on the side of a V-belt to quiet it down. So, you know, the thing of it is, is what you got to remember. EPDM belts um, are, are certainly less resistant to oils. And and let, if you have a noisy belt and you squirt it with oil, guess what? It's going to get quiet. But what happens is if it's belt dressing or oil or any of that stuff, you spray it, 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 the immediate result is the belt will get quiet. But what happens is that EPDM belt absorbs those oils. And when it absorbs those oils, it swells the rib up. So with within a very short time of fixing what we perceive as fixed noise, that rib starts to swell up and it'll make even more noise. So it's a temporary sure. fix, it's not a permanent fix. Yeah, and that's the thing I want to stress because, you know, it, we stress doing a professional proper repair. You know, this is certainly not one of them. It's a Band-Aid uh, like anything else. And as, as Robert pointed out, you may cure that issue today and maybe for the next week and the next few weeks. But it's going to come back, and it's going to come back worse than it was before. So, in you know, fact, as Robert pointed out, you know, it is it's consider that noise, consider that squeal, as he pointed out, the check engine light for the belt system, and do a proper diagnosis and fix the underlying cause. Right, and, and it'll come back as you pointed out, perfectly. Pete, it'll come back worse because the belt will be destroyed. So, and yeah, that's a good way to make the customer happy. No, no, not <laughs> pay for the belt twice. So. Um, you know, the impact of misalignment that causes most of the belt noise is, is it's interesting here. We, I built this um, example because a lot of these um, really complex belt drives, you know, where you have the water pump right above the, the, the crankshaft pulley, and it's a quick wraparound. Um, we noticed it on some vehicles that, that uh, there's slight bearing wear in the water pump but it doesn't leak or nothing, but it's just just enough bearing wear to cause the pulley to be slightly tilted, and that just that slight tilt, and in, in the you know, and you see the, the 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 drawing on the right that any little misalignment on a close pulleys can be drastic versus a pulley that's spread further apart, you know, has more time to you know kind of fix itself and enter into the pulleys a little a little easier. But when yeah. those pulleys are close on some drives. Any misalignment, they're jamming that belt into that pulley, and this is exaggerated somewhat, but it's jamming, you can see it though, the, the ribs are going to jammed in there and it'll cause noise. So, you know, misalignment can be slight and can and to cause noise, as you see the degrees here. I mean, if it's over two and a half degrees out of misalignment, the belt's going to fly off the pulley. So yeah, I mean, the Ranger that I just worked on was a perfect example, Robert. I mean, the, the, the issue was that the power steering pump pulley had not been reinstalled properly. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was not pressed in all the way in, in alignment with the other shafts, and the the I believe it was the alternator. Um, you know, the pulley just above it is maybe only eight inches away, center to center. So uh, as you pointed out, just maybe just a small shift creates a larger angle, and sure. uh, and certainly uh, as you pointed out, can uh, cause the noise it did on the Ford, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and the possibility of of spitting the belt off. Sure, and, and you know, you, you, I'm glad you brought up power steering pulleys. I, I work with engineers, and we write technical bulletins all the time on belt noise. And 
and I'm so surprised, but there, I think the biggest cause of misalignment, if it's not a worn tensioner or worn idler pulley, is, is these pressed on power steering pump pulleys. I know sure. a lot of Chrysler products have them. Your, your Ford right there had a pressed on pulley that it gets out of alignment. It only needs to be out a little bit to start making noise, like a degree. And, uh, and we'll get into some tools to how to, uh, in a couple slides here, how to see this misalignment. But power steering pump pulleys, if you have a misalignment issue and the tension room pulleys were replaced, or idler pulleys, that would be my first place to look, you know. Cause oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's easy. It's easy to not get it on exactly right. You know, I'm being sure. a little bit short without some way of being able to check the alignment when you're done. Sure, and we'll get into the laser tool here in a couple of slides. But uh, squeal, and we covered this, Pete, already. I mean, if you spray, if you spray water and it gets louder, uh, you, it's a tension issue. If you rev the engine and it gets louder, it's a tension issue, and it's squeal. It's we characterize that as squeal. So, you know, the, the, when you hear something that when you rev it gets louder, spray water and gets louder, it's a tension issue. Look at the tensioner. If it's a manually tensioned vehicle, um, um, check that tension. Needs retension after the belt seats in after a while. Um, usually would cause uh, or correct all, all the noise problems you have there. So. Well, here you go. We talked about contamination, belt dressing, brake cleaner, antifreeze, oil, power steering fluid, windshield, even windshield washer fluid to some extent. Any, uh, any environment like that where the belt's prolonged, has prolonged uh, coating of this stuff in there and they spend some time in it, it will cause the belt to, to make a lot more noise and, uh, and even destroy the belt. So if you're pulling a radiator hose off and dumps a lot of antifreeze in, take the time to squirt it down with water so it doesn't sit in the antifreeze on a newly replaced belt. Um, sure. Um, it's probably good, uh, good advice. And, and listen, when it comes to belt dressing, it's a huge no-no. Um, I, I would never use it. Uh, the engineers cringe when they even talk about belt dressing, what it does <laughs> to a belt. So <laughs> we don't like it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, moving on. Well, we talked about a tool. How do you identify these misalignments? The number one cause for noise is misalignment. So, there's various tools out there in the market. This is our tool. Um, what our tool st uh, stands out, I think, from the competition is we have a linear laser, not just a dot. So, what that does is that helps measure misalignment in in two ways: either angular um, uh, misalignment if you have a worn bearing. Or, or, um, or if a pulley's like the Ford you, example you gave, if the pulley's not pressed on, you're going to see it that way as well. Yeah. So you can see misalignment two ways. We have two-piece laser here. One's just a receiver to kind of, if the laser goes right through the Deco logo, we shamelessly make sure that happens so we can see our logo all the time, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, that means the belt is in a line. But uh, this is a handy tool um, that, we, that we use, and it, it certainly helps. You know, when you're in a situation where you see, when you see all these pulleys in a 10-point drive and a mechanic scratching his head, usually you fasten this laser to the crankshaft pulley. That's our fixed pulley, really, and mm -hmm. uh, and you go around it, and you'll start to notice if anything's out of alignment. You could, uh, you know, get to the root cause a lot quicker than in the past. Just changing pieces and hoping for the best. Sure. And let me ask one quick question here, Robert. I noticed that when uh, we're using it on the Ford. You know, multiple pulleys. Uh, not all of them were a clear line of sight from the crank pulley. Sure. If I have verified that, say, you know, an, another drive pulley is in line, yeah. Could then I use that as a as a base for those that I can't reach with the harmonic balance? Uh, oh, with the attached harmonic balancer. Absolutely. In most cases, you'll have to do that. You start at the crankshaft, right, and you work your way around every pulley that seems to be in line. You could anchor the laser to that, and then until you find it, you know, and kind of use deductive reasoning to figure out <laughs> where this misalignment occurs. But absolutely, I we've done it all the time in some of the videos, we're, installation videos we're doing, because it's not a simple. Uh, me you saw earlier in the presentation. These these belt drives are not simple. It's not like you can just spin them around to every component. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a good, good idea. And, and where can technicians find out about getting, you know, the, the kit that you have here? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, again, you go to any Deco distributor, we'll be able to order one of these. Um, you can go to our website to find a local Deco distributor. I mean, there's a locator guy, but I'm sure most of the professional technicians, they, they buy belts. 
from uh, various outlets. They know who has Daco and, and who doesn't. So um, you can go to the, uh, the Facebook page and leave a message, and we can even have a, a Daco um, sales representative in that area maybe stop by and, and work with you and the distributor to, to get them one. And throughout the year, we love running promotions with these, and we've had over the summer ran a promotion. So these technicians have a chance to, if they're installing our product, to get one of these for free. And, and I think uh, later this winter, because you know, with cold weather, makes noise come around a little bit quicker, makes that belt a little more stiffer. We'll we'll run another promotion. So you know, keep your eyes on the website, the Facebook page, and all that. So not to lose an opportunity. Yeah, awesome. Um, moving here, I mean, understanding the opportunity for belts. We do this every year, and um, AAIA is an industry group, and they run. They have a B Car Care Aware um, uh, um, program there, and then every April they have these, they have these check lanes, and they go through all the vehicles that come in, and they check how what the oil's like. Is there any? Is the tire wear fine? How's the belts? Right. How's the hoses and all that? You know. Right. And we look at this every year, and for every year, it's been right around 20% of the vehicles um, surveyed, they had a worn belt that need replaced. And it's like one out of five. That's a huge opportunity out there. Uh, this past year that did it, we noticed it's 15%. We like to credit ourselves because of our training like this. That we're, <laughs> we're helping technicians find these opportunities and cash in on them, and it's wonderful for everybody, including especially the consumer. Sure. Um, so... So we like to present that there is an opportunity out there. Get yourself some of these wear gauges and not lose, lose out on, 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 on those opportunities that walk right through your door. Yeah, and, I, and, I'm, and I've got to interject here a little bit on my soapbox, Robert, forgive me, but I've always been a big proponent that when a customer brings a vehicle into my shop or into my bay, um, it's just like going to your doctor. You expect that doctor to give you the full benefit of his experience and his professionalism you owe the same thing to the customer who brings you their car. Now, you know this is going to be shown, of course, on YouTube and our uh, Auto Pro Workshop. Uh, a lot of consumers and do-it-yourselfers watch our videos as well. Hey, for you guys, uh, this is not about uh, just additional sales for the shop that takes care of your cars. Yeah, sure, they have to keep the lights on and pay the bills and keep the doors open in order to serve you. But it's also about helping protect you against unnecessary breakdowns or more expensive component damage. Uh, guys, if you're a professional technician, that's the reason. You know, consider every car like it was your grandma's car. You know, would you want to go out the door knowing there's something there that you should tell her about that could cause her a problem and find her, you know, sitting on the side of the interstate during rush hour, you know, with a car that's not going anywhere because you didn't tell them. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now and give it back to you, Robert. <laughs> I love your soapbox. Well put, um, I, and I agree. And I and, and I know, as you know, the guys who work in the service counter and all that, it's not always so easy. Come in and people are in a defensive stance anyhow because they just don't love getting their car serviced. And but you, you're absolutely right. Um, people take these vehicles on trips and everything else, and this one belt breaks, it, the car stops, as we all know. Know so we got to go through and um, and use the tools that we're given and uh, and and. and and inform these consumers um, about the about the possibility of a breakdown and and it's it's a rubber belt the belt's made of rubber it will not last forever uh, at the end of the day so sure um, and speaking of that I got I'll end up on this last chart here you know we talk about eighty percent of belt failures occur over eighty five thousand miles and if you think about that that's really no big revelation right <laughs> because right. it just gets even more if you're at hundred and twenty thousand miles you, you know you're kinda of on borrowed time or more as it goes some belts even some may even go further people test it so you know when you pass that magic mark opportunity failure is great and uh... and that's usually kind of like our opportunity when, when we're spending time in the shops with with technicians is if the vehicle's over 85,000, start looking at it and check those conditions. Check the vehicle and um, and uh, do the right thing. So, yeah, and and I'm just going to tell it too again because from your own chart there, you look at uh, things starting at about 40,000. So sure. again, that's, that's oh, yeah. to my point, guys. You know, a visual inspection alone is not enough on these newer belts. These and these have been around for what last ten years, six, over seven, ten, ten years. Ten years now. So. You know, not only do you have vehicles who are entering that age or past that age for normal maintenance, <clears throat> excuse me, but because of the wear patterns that don't exist that we're used to seeing, um, you need the little gauge that, that they show either from Deco or, or any of the other belt manufacturers for that. You know, I mean, they all offer one. 
uh, but get one, put it in your toolbox, and uh, and use it, you know, to check those belts. Well, Robert, I really appreciate you taking the time to share that vital information with us. Uh, again, whole purpose of our in the workshop series is to reach out to experts in the industry, so that the guys in the field can learn the facts and get rid of the myths and and learn how to do the job professionally, effectively, and efficiently. Thank you so much, you know, for taking the time to be with us today. Well, it was our pleasure, Pete. Thanks again. We appreciate your help out there and spreading the message. It, uh, I think it's very helpful, and uh, we're delighted to be part of it. So we'll see you next time.